Hey everyone, I'm your host Brittany Jones Cooper and welcome back to Build. If you're coming to New York, then you need to see the play White Noise from Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Susan Lori Parks. It follows four lifelong friends, 30 somethings who are progressive, creative, and woke, but whose bonds start to fray after a racially motivated incident with the cops leaves one of them feeling shaken and looking for to take extreme measures for self preservation. White Noise tackles issues of race and identity with heart dark humor, and unsettling precision. Please help me welcome playwright Susan Lori Parks, stars Divi Diggs, and Thomas Sadowski. You're going like this, Susan Lori, but that's how I feel. Um, I got to see this play about a week and a half ago, and I'm happy that I've had the time to sort of sit with it, because a lot of emotions were brought up immediately, and I couldn't quite pinpoint what, it, what I felt. It was, anger was the most accessible, and then uh, fear, and then a lot of emotion and sadness, and I sort of landed in a place of feeling uh, empowered and like ready to sort of have conversations and speak about it. So I wanna thank all of you just for having the bravery to write this and participate in it every night, because emotionally I'm sure it's, a, it's taxing, or it can be. Yeah, I mean, you just described <laughs> the rehearsal process, I think, for us. It was like the exact same thing, but stretched out over three weeks or whatever. Yeah, three weeks, yeah. yeah. So Susan Laurie, let's yeah. start with you. I want to know, um, White Noise, yeah. where did this come from? Yeah. When did, why? <laughs> yeah, why? No, it started, it started um, in the theater where it's playing right now, in the Ansbacher Theater at the Public Theater. When I was watching a play, Father Comes Home from the... the Father comes home from the wars. Oh. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, you remember the part where the guy ho is holding his hands up like this and he's imagining, because the play takes place in 1860 in America, and the guy's imagining what it's going to be like in the future. And watching that play night after night, I thought, I got to write a play about this guy's future. Uh -huh. And it started. And what's real cool about White Noise is that moment, the hands up moment, happens again in this play in exactly the same spot on the stage in the space. So that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And so I kind of talked about the plot a little bit in yeah. the intro, but I would like yeah. to hear from you how you describe White well, Noise. You just did it so well. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's 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 yeah, four friends who are who are who've been friends since college, and they're really really tight. Um, and we got a, a brother and his best friend, Ralph, and they were best friends in college. They were roommates in college. They were on the bowling team together in college. If you can imagine, they were like, you know, all American bowlers. And yeah, I know it's funny. And, and there's bowling in the play. There's actual bowling, lots of bowling in the play. And uh, then, there, then there are two women in the play, Dawn and Misha, a sister, a black woman, and a white woman, Dawn. And they, are, they're all, they have all been friends from college. And some, I don't know what we can say on, on this program. Some shit want. goes down. Yeah. Some shit goes down, a racially motivated incident involving Leo. This is Leo's character, David. And, um, and then we watch that really tight friendship explode, hit the fan, um, and disintegrate. Uh, brilliantly played by these guys. But truly, because uh, that friendship is so central to the play, and you're rooting for it, and at the same time, you know it has to unravel in order, order for them to sort of get clarity. Um, for you two, what was the most attractive part of this script and being a part of White Noise? Susan Laurie Parks. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, seriously, when, when they when they when they called me and said, would you be interested in doing a play at the Public Theater that was written by Susan Laurie Parks, I said yes. And they said, would you like to read it? And I said, I'll get around to it. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, of course. Um, and then I was like, oh yeah, and by the way, who's in it? Right. <laughs> and they said, well, Oscar's directing it, David's in it, and I was like, oh my God. Uh, uh, so it was amazing, and, you know, but sitting down and actually reading the play for the first time, I mean, I. After I read the first act, I called my wife and I said, um, this is something really incredibly special. And then I read the second act and I called her back and I said, I think I just read maybe one of the most important pieces of theater that's been written in the past half century. And um, I said, I didn't know that we were, I didn't know that we were having this conversation. Mm. I didn't know that we as a society were having this conversation yet. I didn't know that we were capable of having this conversation in this way, and that's what great art does, right? It sparks a moment of conversation before you're ready, before you as a society are ready. And I think, you know, probably no, no time like the present, no better time than now 
um, the, to, to start talking. And then, you know, we got into the room and just started going. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, <clears throat> Oscar sent me the script. We, I've been trying to get back to the public since I left, but, uh, what did you do at the public? I don't know. Some, I can't even remember. Small, it was so long ago, but, yeah, and, yeah, uh, but the, I was trying, I, we were, we've been looking for something to do together, but scheduling never worked out and all these other things. And also like, I don't, I don't know. I hadn't, hadn't read a play that it was like the thing. Susan Laurie's been my favorite playwright since I was 18. So like it was already, I was already very excited about it, but he sent me a play and I'm like in between scenes working on this TV show and I've read it. And by the end of it, I was like pacing back and forth around my trailer, just like, fuck, no. Oh, you, oh no, what? You, you know, like you can't, I was just so amped up. And I called Oscar back immediately. It was like, I have to, I don't even know. They're like calling me on set right now. I have to go, but I have to do this play. So I don't know what we have to do, but let's just, yes, it's a hard yes. We'll figure it out. And then I, uh, and I just haven't stopped thinking about it since. And then I think, um, getting in the room was just like I was not I, it was so much more than I could have hoped for I think it, it, I was not prepared for um how deep the work was going to have to go um but also how deep we would get to go and for the, and also for this you know I didn't I'd never worked with any of these people before so like um, it, it really was kind of the most incredible room. It's the it's the stuff dreams are made of for actors, for sure. I mean, you just, you know, the kinds of conversations we had in there are the, are the kinds you hope to have in your life all the time. And you, you talk about your character, Leo, and the work you had to do. Um, it starts off with his traumatic event, but he's sort of re-traumatized several times throughout the play having to sort of deal with things. For you as an actor, how do you get into that headspace? How do you prepare to deal with that emotion and that weight? And and can you leave it at the end of the night? Uh, I can't, you know, <laughs> I, I say this all the time because you said this like week two of rehearsal or something when we, we had just done our first run through and we were whooped. Yeah. And we were, we were like, this is impossible to do eight times a night. It's actually gonna be, I don't know if this was a good idea. It's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna work out. And Susan Laurie said, you know, when I was writing it by myself, it was heavy. And then Oscar came along and it got a little lighter. And then now you guys are in here and it's a little lighter. And she said, when, when we get out there and we're performing it, there's 300 people in there every night and the weight's gonna be distributed more evenly. And at first I was like, okay, but you ain't out there doing nothing. So don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what you, maybe you don't know what you're talking about. But it was, she was exactly right because our, our last designer run was excruciating, it felt almost undoable. And the next night was a final dress rehearsal and there were people in there and we finished and I was ready to go again. I was like, let's do it right now. I just learned so much out there from all these people. I don't want to forget it before tomorrow. Let's do it again right now. Yeah. And Thomas, your character is asked to do something that feels impossible to him and carries a lot of historical weight and exposes a lot of his own, maybe some things that he's buried deep inside and doesn't want to confront. He's almost wearing like a dashiki on the outside and like a MAGA hat on the inside. It's like really, it's really <laughs> conflicting. And, uh, and a lot of the times I wanted to hurt your character. Like he's very frustrating in a lot of ways. So for you digging into a, a man who is really tough to sort of listen to sometimes or like his, when he's expressing those feelings, what is that like for you? Well, it's not really my, it's not my job to make this easy on anybody. As an artist, it's not my job to make this easy on anybody. It's not my job to make it any more difficult on anybody either, although we do have fun with that sometimes. Um, but uh, as an artist, regardless of the play and regardless of who I'm playing, it's not my job to make Susan Laurie's story easier on you because this isn't an easy story. This isn't an easy reality. This is the original sin of this country. And if we're gonna talk about it, we have to talk about it. And if, and if we're going to actually talk about it, then we have to deal with actual fact, objective fact. And we have to look at it clearly, concisely, and in all of its horrid glory, you know? And um, so for me, 
uh, you know, I think that we went through a process in the re in the rehearsal process. I think you know, to a certain extent, um, it started out in this with this idea of like, <laughs> you know, I think that that on some level there was a a need or a want or a desire to soften the edges. And I think that it came from this really beautiful, empathetic place inside of um, you know the those of us who are trying to like take that edge off. And what the realization was is that we actually can't afford that because that's what we've been doing all along is sanding off the edges and sanding off the edges and sanding off the edges. And by doing that repeatedly, moment after moment after moment, day after day after day after week after month after year after decade after century, you no longer have an edge and it's just become this polished sheen, you know? And it's almost like it's, it's, it doesn't resemble the reality of what it actually is anymore. So leaving the edges sharp, leaving the edges unpalatable, leaving it raw is precisely what we have to do. And I think that, you know, I have the same reaction to Ralph as you do. Of course. You know, but I can't, I, I, don't, I don't have the luxury of judging him while I'm out there. Of course. Yeah. You know. Because I know Ralph, and that's why it was hard to watch. Me too. I, I knew where he was gonna go, but not because it was a predictable plot, it's because I feel like I know Ralph, and I know men in my life who maybe would make the same choices. And that's where it felt really real. Because also, I mean, I would just add to that we know Ralph. And f from my perspective, I love Ralph. Right. I love him. I recognize in Ralph, in Misha, and the four characters, in Ralph, in Misha, in Dawn, in Leo, we've all, everyone who has uh, an interaction with this country has been promised something. We've all been promised something. And for all of us, and I don't care who you are, or where you're from, or who your parents are, or whatever, those promises are not being fulfilled. And there is a lot of confusion and discontent and uncertainty because for all of us, those promises aren't being fulfilled. So I just, but you don't want to add that to the. Yeah. I, I was going to follow up on that, and that each of the characters gets to have this monologue where they explain yeah. their background, their stance, and they're incredibly powerful. Also, you guys incorporate the audience. There's a lot of eye contact. It feels almost targeted. When Sharia Irving was giving her monologue, it was a black about black women. She looked at me. Mm -hmm. She looked at me a couple times, mm -hmm. and I felt it. So, is that a direction that the actors were given, or is that something that just comes out when you're in that space? Well, it's it's. The, the monologues are called solos because way back in the day, these four characters that were in a band. And so the idea that they're giving a monologue, they're giving a solo, and it's very important to connect with the audience. I mean, uh, certainly lots of things were developed in rehearsal, but the idea was yeah. connect. Yeah, when you connect. Because Thomas, at points, your character will jump up on a, a ledge. And oh, yeah, I get right there. It's really <laughs> immersive. It, it makes it even harder to ignore sort of some of the subject matter because you're, you're right there. Right. Yep. Right, right. What is it like playing in that space? Does that help your performance? Y yes. I mean, I, I think so much of what happens in this play <clears throat> is about a community negotiating how they feel about, about things, right? And so we get to watch everybody doing that from our position on stage all night, trying to... Because the, the, the lights are up enough for a lot of the show that, that people have to check in with each other to see if something is funny or to see if something is, it, like, what is okay for me to laugh at? Or is everybody else terrified right now? Or is it just me? There's so much audience negotiation going on that it really, um, more than anything else I've ever done, this show is actually different every night. We always say that as actors, and it is true. But, like, I, we were just talking about last night. Like, I, you can't predict, there's no... Normally, you're like, I'm going to pause here for a laugh every night because there is always one. That doesn't happen in this show. None of the jokes are necessarily jokes. We all have to decide every night whether or not this is a joke. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then sometimes there are disagreements. And sometimes people in the audience need to be incredibly vocal about what they are feeling about that. You know, that happens too, where it's where. It, where for some people, if this isn't a joke, then everything I believe is shattered. So I'm gonna laugh super fucking loud at this right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, 
it's a really interesting it's a really fascinating position to be in, but it, so I don't know, I don't know if it makes it easier, but it is all part of the experiment of the play. No, it's, a, it's a 304 person conversation. I have to tell one joke that maybe people won't get. So there are four characters. No, I have to tell the Ninja Turtles joke. Oh, so you get four it to, oh, no. Four characters, just to give it, a, there are four characters. Oh, it's okay. There are four characters in the play. Um, Leonardo, uh, Leo, Ralph, Dawn, and Misha, right? And anybody who knows the Ninja Turtles, will know where I got the names for the characters from. So that is the bedrock. That's the starting point for this play. A dumb joke. Um, <laughs> that turned into these really amazing characters. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah, that. yeah. Well, yeah. You talk about the humor, and uh, I think one p disconnect I had from some of the people around me was the Ask a Black. Yeah, yeah. And they would laugh, and I didn't laugh, uh -huh. you know, because I, I knew what she was having to do and sort of sacrifice. Right. Um, and so take me through writing that character, because that was something where you're sort of uh, black splaining, and I thought that was a really interesting commentary that I haven't seen in a lot of art about sort of the pressures of black people to explain things. The pressures of, of black people on, on uh, live stream shows. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, this one. Like this one. <laughs> right, 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 right. And how we have to constantly perform. Oh, we all do, though. Wherever you're from, we're always performing ourselves. Always. I mean, Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, you know? We're always performing ourselves, whoever we are and wherever we're from. And in my experience, for people of African descent, we might put on a little extra grease to make ourselves marketable, like they did on the auction block. Boom, boom. So we do, we, and we still sometimes do that today because, in, as Misha says, in some contexts, playing black is marketable. And in other contexts, like sitting in Starbucks, minding your own business, being and playing black is not. So that's something we're negotiating. Uh, but it's not just something that folks of African descent negotiate. We all do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so many of the themes and, and topics that are covered in this are so deeply historical yeah. that you almost have to see it more than once to get it all. But even when you mentioned the auction block, there's references to that. Uh, black people as performers for entertainment, appropriation. I mean, there's so many different things that are tackled. For you, is there a, a takeaway or something that you want people to hold on to well, specifically, I, or is it just sort of a whatever you can? Well, this is the thing. There's, there's a, I was a writing student years ago of James Baldwin, the great James Baldwin, I was my creative writing teacher. And he has this quote. He says, um, the task of the artist is the same as the task of a lover. Because I love you, my task is to show you things that you might not notice. And so... Our task is to show you things that you might not notice. And just take away that, for starters. Um, and some of the things that you do notice that are hard not to look at, like uh, this, the slave chains, I thought that was a really uh, important and hard to watch scene. David, for you, um, why is that important, do you feel like, to be in, in this play? Uh, because... because it, it's a reality of the of the legacy that we're all living with. So I think that image is really important, but it's also important that that image comes after a long litany of really funny jokes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and also it's like, it also happens at the peak of when these the relationship for these two best friends is kind of the most successful it's ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the moment when they have to deal with this, with the, with the reality of, of, the legacy of slavery that we all live with. And that, that to me, <clears throat> um, makes it even more painful because we're watching successful, everyone in this play is pretty successful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we're watching successful people become more successful and then have to grapple with that reality, right? With like by buying into something that we have been very intentionally covering up our whole lives, right? We never talk about it, we don't, we pretend, we know we're woke, we know we don't participate in this, we know there is a, there is a hard line between good and bad. Uh, but all, all four of these characters have to sort of come to terms with the fact that that line is a lot more gray than they thought it was, and that you are, they are, they garner a certain amount of success by participating in something that they had all, that we all silently agreed, a contract that no one ever signed not to participate in, you know? Um, and so if we're going to participate in it, if you're going to have the success, then you have to really deal with it. And that's, that's kind of Leo's, that is sort of Leo's motivating factor throughout, right? Is that there is something at the end of this journey that nobody wants to talk about.
that the world doesn't want me to know. And so we're, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. <clears throat> and to realize that we're all connected. It sounds corny, right? It sounds so fucking corny, but we are. I mean, we're all part of the everything. And that's one of the things that he finds out, you know. But I, I and I'm trying to think of the joke. There's so many jokes in the play, but it's hard to say it's a play that concerns itself with like racism and friendship. And there are a lot of jokes. People go, ooh, but there are. Yeah. But I think that's why it's so yeah. complicated because these characters are as close as you can be. So there is a natural comfort. There is humor. There is familiarity, and that is a, a joy to watch. But when you start diving down in the layers, which a lot of us have friend groups where that happens, it gets real really fast. And that's not always fun to watch, uh, but it's important to like soak in. So again, I had a blast. I have to know, uh, do you, did you guys get any better at bowling? I, I'm a terrible bowler, and I had to... <clears throat> the original drawing of the stage that was showed to me had this bowling alley like parting the audience, like actually, and I was like, Oscar, I'm gonna kill up a bunch of people. Like I. <laughs> I don't know, like 50% of the balls I throw are gutter balls, and there's no gutters. So all of everyone lining this bowling alley is dead. And, uh, and, so, and so they were giving me bowling lessons. Like, I took bowling lessons before we started rehearsal. But those weren't really helpful, because those are teaching you how to knock down pins, which I don't have to do. I just have to look like I know what I'm doing and bowl in a straight line. And it uh, turns out bowling coaches don't care about that. So uh, it, it was an interesting, but once, once we got in the space and figured it out and, and, and learned the sort of parameters of the thing, I, but I haven't been bowling since the first week of rehearsal, so I don't know if I'm any better. You got, you got the moves, though. You got the I look way better. Yo, you look great. Doing it. You look great. The form is yeah. impeccable. I, my bowling is so impressive that it was removed from the show entirely. <laughs> I, I actually, there was quite a bit of bowling that I had was, in this show, was. and and I don't roll a single ball now. Oh, it is all gone. Bad. No, it's, it's no. It, you're right. It's you not were because certainly I'm one bad. of the better bowlers. You're a great hype man, and you know every That's what good, it's about. That's, every yeah. good competitor needs his boy on the side <laughs> hyping him up, and you do that. But you know, actually, the best bowler in the real world, I think, in the cast was Zoe Winters, and yeah. she had the task of having to bowl left-handed early on. Her yeah. character was left-handed. And uh, so she like literally was teaching herself how to bowl left-handed and still beating me every time we went bowling. So <laughs> uh, well, we do have a couple of questions before we get out of here. The first comes from Twitter. Sue Brett wants to know, what do you hope that the audience will take away from seeing the show? I always say, what do you hope the conversation is after, after the show at dinner, you know? I mean, if we can just look each other in the eye and start talking about who we really are, and accept each other after that and during that conversation, like, hey, this is me. This is what's going on for me. I think that would be really lovely. Like the conversations that we had in rehearsal when we were creating it. I think we say often that we're, all of us are a little bit jealous of this friend group in a lot of ways because of the depth of their honesty yeah. and because of, you know, really everybody signed on to a thing that they are vehemently opposed to because one of them said he needed it so bad. You know, the closeness of that friendship is one that is kind of envious. And so even at the end of all of this, after watching it fall apart, there's something about that kind of honesty that I think is, I don't know, certainly is inspiring me yeah. it, further on in my life to like br bring things forward more readily than I normally would. It reminds you that those friendships take work, especially when you meet friends in college. I've dealt with that recently. It's just, we chose each other. So let's talk about what we need to talk about because we're different people now. You know, we change. Uh, who do we have first in the audience? Hi. Um, I am now questioning my friends as friends mm. based on your character. <laughs> uh, and, and I really disliked you for a while there, personally. Um, but I really love you, and I've always loved your work, so thank you very much. Um, the, the other thing as well is that I got on the sixth train after the show, and about three of us, people I did not know, of course we had the, brochure, the, the program there, and we all started talking until we got up to the Upper East Side, and it was phenomenal. They happen to be white, by the way, and we got into it and referred back to some of our older work, Pardon me. And uh, really, really, I love you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thanks again, really. Thank you. Thanks.
Yeah, I had the same. Uh, the conversations afterwards are always, like I said, I'm happy that I had some time to process because you do sort of have to sit with it for a minute and see what comes up, you know. Uh, who's next? I'm next. Oh, my God. Oh, Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, David, I have a question for you. Okay. I was lucky my daughter introduced me to you yes. after Hamilton. I had no idea how wonderful this meeting was. I also have a ticket but thanks that same daughter is taking me to see White Noise on April 7. I happened to be, when I was 97, uh, Museum of Modern Art picked me up to start a free program for seniors. I did not consider myself an artist. I figured my children were but not me, and like most parents. Uh, however, I did the pre-med, because my dad, dad wanted to be a doctor. So I wasted time, because I was terrible in organic uh, chemistry. <laughs> however, I'm doing great. I'm 98 now, and I am uh, I am loving doing art. A lot of it has brought up a lot of feelings, though, and I know your play is going to do something for me. And I am so excited about seeing both of you on April 7. Now, I wondered how old were you when you had this burning desire to be an actor, or did you want to be something else? What happened with your development? Um, that's a great question. I, I, first of all, we can't wait to see you on the 7th. I'm so excited <laughs> for you to be in this audience. But um, I was, I mean, I, I was acting in school plays and stuff pretty young, maybe 13 years old, 12 or 13 years old or something. So I, I knew it was a thing I loved. I didn't have any models for that. I didn't know anybody who did that personally until much, much later in life. So I didn't know how to go about doing that. So I don't know, I don't remember ever saying I wanted to be an actor. You know, I don't remember ever labeling it that. Um, I just r remember, I just remember that, uh, I'm I'm very very shy and I and I remember that being on stage was the way that I could be in groups of people. I'm I'm a, I'm like an introverted extrovert, right? I love I love big groups of people, but I am very very shy. And so when you're on stage, you get to be in big groups of people, but it's not really about you. So I don't have to be shy cuz I'm not me, right? Um, and so that that was the reason I sort of gravitated towards it, and all the other like performing arts that I sort of participate in come from that same place. This um, this you know, like you found for yourself, the the sort of desire to explore things artistically, because that is a way of thinking about the world that helps you process the world, helps me process the world. But then also, then performing that work allows me to be around people and, and have something to say. <laughs> uh, so that's that was really it for me. But I, So I've been doing it for a long time, but I don't know when I decided, oh, this is a job. I, I still don't really think of it as a, I don't know, man. I, always, I just, I don't know, I think I... I, I'll, I just say I write rap songs and that's it. For me, that like encompasses everything, you know, but I, don't, I still, it's still a hard, I still have a hard time self-identifying as an actor, I think, because I don't actually know what that means. Yeah. Likewise, Thomas, your uh, theater credits are so extensive. What is it about this medium specifically that you're so drawn to? <clears throat> um... Theater is the last bastion of truth in this society. The lights go down, the actor steps out onto the stage, and all the bullshit is completely stripped away. Um, that, is, that can be used to great effect um, as a, a, a medium or a force to have discussions like we're doing 
with this show, it can be used to great effect just to entertain people because sometimes that's just as important. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it is for me the medium where the real collaboration happens. You know, um, television is an advertiser's medium, film is a director's medium, theater is a writer, writer and an actor's medium, is a collaborative medium. You know, uh, it, it, you know, and the director too, obviously, and the lighting designer, the set designer, the sound designer, the composers, like all of these artists get together and create together. And man, like our show grew exponentially because Clint Ramos was in there asking questions. He's our amazing set designer. He's asking questions. Before I knew it, I was making different choices and different moments based on questions he had asked Oscar. And I was like, damn, I never thought of that. But like, it's the one art form where I really feel like everybody comes together to create something and deliver it without pretense and without bullshit directly to an audience. And um, I don't know many other, I personally haven't experienced many other mediums where that's been true, music to a certain extent. Um, but even that, it's a you know bit of a long shot. So this is, it's the place that I think I sort of came preloaded with this DIY kind of like weird little punk rock ethos. And it's the thing that most sort of cleanly allows that part of me to express itself. It's the, it's, it's the, the least bumpy road. Yeah. I love that. And one last question before we go. Okay, thank you. Um, I gotta ask, during your career, which has been the biggest challenge you had to face? Thank you. Susan, Laurie, do you wanna start? We can maybe go down. Well, just to keep it simple, writing this play was, the, this is the hardest play that I've ever written. Um, to keep in my mind the four opposing points of view simultaneously. I mean, it is a, a, a feat, uh, and you guys are amazing every night to perform it. But imagine, you know, I'm in my room at my kitchen table writing this out of nothing. There's nothing there, and I'm having to conjure up these four very different people who have four very different points of view. And so often I wanted to quit writing, and so often my husband, Christian, said, keep going, keep going. I know it's hard, but you have to tell this story because you're the only one who can do it. And so I just kept going. So this has been the greatest challenge so far. And, and I start working on a TV show tomorrow, and that's going to be the next greatest challenge. Yeah. Well, I'm happy that you kept going. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the toughest, wow, man, the toughest challenge in my career, I think, honestly, um, was realizing that um, being an artist required um, activism out of me. Because from the very, very beginning, I was told, you know, shut up, you're just an actor. We don't want you to do anything but just go act. Go, go meet Puppet, go, entertain us. And the reality of the situation is if you're going to be an artist of any medium in this world, you have to have an opinion. You have to be active. Um, and uh, there's, nobody, there's nobody else who's got a voice like you. There's nobody else who's got a voice like me or Susan Laurie or David, thank God. you know. Um, and that it is my job to get out there, listen to the people on the street interact with humanity and then have an opinion and work actively to bring something decent and good into this world. That's an uphill battle in this industry that wants so desperately for you to join the ranks of the people who are telling everybody out there, you need to look like this, you need to say like this, you need to behave like this, you need to do like this, you need to Instagram filter yourself like this, you need to X, Y, blah, 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 blah. I don't choose to play that fucking game anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was a hard, hard thing to learn how to do. Um, I think for me, just <clears throat> trying to, um, every, every sort of new step, everything, you, every time you do something new in your career as an artist, um, you learn a whole bunch, and that's why I keep doing it and keep pushing myself towards that. But also, um, 
there become more demands on your time. There become more, you know, other stresses. You end up traveling more than you used to, or you end up whatever. And sort of maintaining relationships and friendships that that predated wherever you are uh, in that is is a tricky process and one that I I think is all of us are probably constantly assessing um, and and reassessing. And so I think um, figuring out how um, to l love your work and then also love the people in your life appropriately is right now the thing I struggle with the most. <laughs> and I, met, I would imagine that's hard when you're putting your heart and soul into your art. Susan Laurie, I could feel you throughout all of this and I know that you put everything into it. And for the two of you, your performances, I know that you leave it out there every night. I can see it in the tears, I can see it in your body. And so thank all three of you for just providing something for us to talk about at a time where it has never been more important. So uh, if you guys want to go see White Noise, you can do that now through May 5th at the Public Theater. Please put your hands together for Susan Laurie Park, Thanks, Debbie Brittany. Diggs, and Thomas Sadowski. Thank you, Brittany.